All across the state, in towns big and small, the people of North Carolina have always worked hard. It's a way of life for the men and women who grew up in these factory towns, working the swing shift, taking care of your family, and sometimes struggling to make ends meet. Our Senate leader, Phil Berger, knows the story well, because it's his story too. A story of hard work, perseverance, and dedication to his family that has defined the path of his life. Phil's dad was a factory worker too, and things weren't always easy for the family. One of my earliest memories is when I was uh, probably four years old, uh, my dad uh, lost his job, um, and uh, all I really knew is that uh, we were moving. I remember uh, being in the car and uh, driving long ways and um, winding up at my uh, grandparents. Uh, it was uh, necessary for, for him to get a fresh start. His father taught him many lessons about the value of hard work. No matter how tough it is, no matter how, ple how unpleasant what you're doing is, you, know, you have a responsibility uh, to yourself and to your family to, uh, to, to make sure that, uh, that, that you do all you can to provide for them. And some lessons were unspoken. My dad always worked with his hands and, uh, you know, his hands in his back. And he worked at, um, uh, at a company that, that made saw blades. He would constantly be getting little shards of steel in his fingers. And he'd come home and uh, have to take tweezers and try to pick that stuff out of, uh, out of his fingers. I would help him do that. I hadn't even thought about that in a long time. Uh, but, um, but he... Um, uh, he worked hard, he did. As a teenager, Phil delivered papers, sold shoes, flipped burgers, and stocked grocery store shelves. And during those high school years, he met the true love of his life, Pat. Pat's brother, Bill, was, uh, was my best friend. And uh, I came over to, uh, to her uh, parents' house uh, to, to see Bill. And, uh, saw her for the first time. Uh, it, it got to the point where my interest in coming over to um, his house became an interest in coming over to her house. He said he wouldn't date me because he knew he'd be stuck with me. <laughs> he she was right. <laughs> it, it worked out that way. Her dad was pretty intimidating. Yeah, really I mean, was. really, he was. Now, I, you know, after... He liked after, him a lot. I mean, yeah. he loved Phil a lot. I mean, he would get on me for talking to other guys on the telephone because he liked him, which you probably don't know that, but... <laughs> <laughs> they started as high school sweethearts, but it didn't take Phil long to realize he wanted Pat to be part of his life forever. He wanted to give her the best, but money was tight. So what I did is I picked the ring out, uh, made arrangements to pay. I can't remember how much it was, $10 a month or something like that uh, on the ring. Uh, got the ring and I was so excited to give it to her that uh, I called and uh, asked her if, uh, if I could come over because I had something I want to talk to her about. And uh, she told me I couldn't come over. <laughs> so you remember that? He came anyway. I, I came anyway. <laughs> came in the kitchen. Uh, ask her to marry me. And I said yes. I, I, I think she said yes. <laughs> got and married, went to work that day. No honeymoon. Yeah, no honeymoon. Well, no, no 40, honeymoon. 41 years of honeymoon. Phil and Pat began their lives together and learned some lessons along the way. We had a little Volkswagen that uh, we didn't have money to fix it. We bought it from his uncle. And uh, this is when we lived on North Main Street and there was a hill out front. We would have to park it on the hill and roll it off every day, even on the way to the hospital to have Philip Jr. Because he did not know you had to put water in the battery. <laughs> so we would jump it off every time. It probably seems like it was a longer period of time than it really was. I don't think it was that long a But period. we could not afford anything else. No. But he didn't know anything about cars. Soon, their young family began to grow. Sons Phil Jr. and Kevin came along. And then, quite a few years later, almost 20, they welcomed a daughter, Ashley, to the family. Our boys were very competitive. We gave them an opportunity 
to do the things they wanted to do. So they wanted to play sports and we wanted to, uh, to, to help them with it. He did lots of stuff with us. I mean, he, he was there, he was our football coach. First uh, uh, time that we played football, he was our coach. I just thought it was important uh, and, and still think it's important for parents to be involved in, in what their kids are doing. Yeah, we and still we go watch the grandkids play as much as we can. I hope they learned that it was uh, important that if they said they were going to do something, that, uh, that they, they did it. My dad has given us the ability to, to say, you know, you've, you've got to push through, you've got to persevere. Both Pat and Phil worked full time to provide for their family. The young couple scheduled their swing shifts so that one parent could always be at home with the children. He worked at uh, Kmart for $1.80 an hour. And I worked at Tallheimer's for $1.60 an hour. And uh, so, yeah, we were, we were conscious of, uh, of, of money and uh, the, the need for, for money, but, you know, it didn't seem to be the most important thing to us, though, at the time. Well, what was important is uh, we were together. Uh, yeah, we had a good time. So uh, I got a job at um, uh, U.S. Gypsum Company. Uh, it was uh, eight hours. It was dusty and dirty and smelly and uh, uh, it, uh, it was hard labor. Uh, hard labor. It was, I mean, it was honest work and it was, uh, it was something to put food on the table. Yeah, and I went to work for Dan River Mills. I ran denim under spools and on a production job. Come out blue every day. It was a hard job. No lunch, just two breaks a day. It didn't take too long for, uh, for, for us to, to kind of realize that you know, this, this is fine, but you know, there, there's probably something better for us. And uh, I, um, I wanted to go back to school. Uh, you know, my dad uh, always told me to you know, get a good education. That's something nobody can take away from you. Phil took a new full-time job at the Kroger grocery store. This job allowed him to take classes at Danville Community College and later at Averett University. I had a friend at uh, Kroger, his name was uh, Mike. Mike Burns, and Mike had re wrecked this, uh, this Jeep. You know, at some point, uh, he, was, uh, he was gonna put it back together and was gonna, uh, get, gonna drive it some more. So finally, you know, he, uh, he and I talked about it enough. I asked him, well, I'll buy it from you. And, uh, it was just you know, a we'll, pile of parts. If you'll help me put it together, we'll, uh, you know, we'll be okay. So I bought it from him. We spent uh, a lot of time working on the Jeep. We'd go out uh, and, uh, and work on it on weekends and uh, put it together. Finally got it uh, all put together and the big challenge was getting a sticker, an inspection sticker on it. It was a 1953, I think, Willis military Jeep. Didn't have turn signals. The steering wheel would turn all the way around. Had a lot of play in the steering wheel. <laughs> and for me to put on brakes, I would actually have to almost stand up to put on brakes. It's very dangerous. <laughs> it was. I, I ended up uh, selling that Jeep uh, to come up with the money to pay my tuition for the first semester at, uh, at Averitt College. Boy, I love that Jeep. Hard work, sacrifice, and perseverance. No matter how tough it was, Phil got it done. He did it lunch hour, supper hour. He arranged a schedule around it so he could go back. I would take a class uh, at lunchtime, either an 11 o'clock class or a 12 o'clock class. And so I'd leave work, uh, jump in my car, and uh, go off to class. And would generally have to come right back. And then I'd usually take one uh, class at night or maybe two classes at night. Between work and family, the going was slow. After a decade of hard work, Phil Berger became the very first member of his family to graduate from college. But he had an even greater goal in mind, law school. My dad and mom were still alive at that time. And uh, I know he was very, uh, very proud. And I uh, had, had finished college and we knew I was uh, gonna be able to go to law school. He bought me a, uh, it's a little statuette of, uh, of, it looks like a guy in a judge's robe uh, holding some books. And uh, I've still got it on my desk. It's. Uh, is something that uh, I know it meant something to him and uh, uh, means a lot to me. When he decided to go to law school, I knew nothing about it. It was something he decided and we were on our way to Greensboro one day and he just came out and said, I want to go to law school. 
floored me. You know, for your husband to quit his job to go back to school when you got two kids, that's not something most people do. We had two, two children. Uh, both of them had, uh, had started school. We were gonna sell our house. I was gonna quit my job. Moved her away from her mom. Um, and we moved into, uh, into an apartment that uh, didn't have a lot of room. Being in law school and raising a family is tough, but Pat and Phil did what they had to do to make it work. Pat worked full time. Phil went to school and painted apartments at night to make sure the rent got paid on time. Phil Jr. remembers. We didn't know exactly what law school was, but we did understand that, um, you know, it, it was something that, that required a lot of his time. You know, even though he had a great deal of uh, work to do, uh, a lot of studying to do, he was always there for us. He would come home every day from school and keep the kids when they got out of school until I got off work. Then he would eat his supper and then he would go back to school and stay till midnight. Uh, many times I'd uh, leave the apartment and go study for a while and then come back and paint an apartment. We started kind of calculating, okay, how long can we do this? You know, looking back, they, they struggled. They, they had to make sacrifices, and uh, a lot of the times we got things when they didn't. My, my dad's earned everything he's gotten, and uh, I've, I've been right there with him all along. So it's been, it's been a lot of fun to be able to, to see what he put into uh, becoming a lawyer, becoming a, a member of the Senate, uh, and being a great father. Phil completed law school and his family put down roots in Eden. With his own struggle to fulfill the American dream fresh in his mind, Phil decided to get into public service to make North Carolina better. You know, I, I got involved in, uh, in politics because uh, I, I think there are a lot of ways that you can uh, have an impact on your community and you can try to leave things better than, than you found them. Unfortunately, uh, the, uh, the elected officials that we've had uh, up to this point uh, have not uh, been willing to do the things that need to be done. I think most politicians are crooked, <laughs> but this one's not. I think a lot of them say what they want to say just to get elected, and then they don't carry out what they say. He, he's honest. I mean, if he says he's going to do something, he'll do it. Uh, and I'll back him in on anything he does. He, he is honest. He is trustworthy. Uh, he's somebody that if he tells you he's going to do something, he, he's going to do it. And I can tell you as his son, he, when he says it, he means it. You know, we, we told people what we were going to do in the last election. And we were serious about it. And we told them that uh, we were going to balance the budget. We were going to do it without raising taxes. Uh, we were going to do it and allow temporary taxes to expire. I think there were a lot of people who were surprised with the fact that we did exactly what we said we were going to do. As a leader of the state senate, Phil led the charge and claimed the first Republican majority in the North Carolina legislature in over 100 years. His leadership and accomplishments have meant real and significant change for the citizens of North Carolina. Tax cuts for small business, sales tax cuts, and personal income tax cuts too. Senate leader Phil Berger has brought our state government from a $2.4 billion deficit to a $145 million surplus today. Forbes magazine now rates North Carolina as one of the top places for businesses and careers. Over 2,000 more state-funded teachers are in classrooms across North Carolina. Phil Berger fought the liberal special interests to enact needed medical liability reforms and to lower costs and improve access to health care. I think we're at, at a critical juncture uh, in terms of what needs to be done and the fact that the right kinds of decisions need to be made. You think about uh, where we started from and, uh, and uh, what we've had an opportunity to do. Now, yeah, we've, we've worked hard, but there's no place else on earth that, uh, that, that people have this, this sort of opportunity. And it's important enough uh, for us to make sure that, uh, that, that those that follow us have the same sorts of opportunities. And, and I see that disappearing uh, fast. Yeah. And I, I feel like I have an obligation, I feel like we have an obligation to try to do something to, uh, to, to change that. Phil Berger, 
an ordinary man who's done extraordinary things for his state.